Slowly descending arpeggios, a distant bell tolling, a suggestion of the sea glimpsed through charmed magic casements, and a muted trumpet sounding the flight of the soul from fairy lands forlorn. I've always thought the final measures of Claude Achille Debussy's Peleas et Mélisande, part lullaby, part requiem, the most beautiful ending any opera was ever given. But then, I've been in love with the music of Debussy since my early teens, when, with two record-collecting friends, I first discovered the 24 piano preludes performed on old 78s by Walter Gieseking. And when I first tried, with I'm afraid minimal success, to recreate those Debussy sound pictures under my fingers. What shimmering piano pieces they were. The engulfed cathedral, the girl with the flaxen hair, mists, sails, and the sounds and fragrances turn on the night air. This is Father Owen Lee talking about opera in the series of cassette commentaries published by the Metropolitan Opera Guild. I am a Catholic priest and a professor of the Greek and Roman classics, but music was the first of my loves. I discovered the aural images of Debussy before I discovered the paintings of Monet and Manet, the poems of Mallarmé and Verlaine, the train of reminiscences that is Proust's quest for lost time, and the correspondences in Baudelaire between sounds, fragrances, and colors. It wasn't till my college days that I found how all of these artists interconnect, how they represent, through different media, that subtle, unearthly flowering of the arts that appeared almost miraculously to challenge academic traditions 100 years ago in Paris. Impressionist painting, symbolist poetry, stream of consciousness prose, and the music of Debussy. The new artists were interested in representing not the ordinary surfaces of human experience, but the impressions human experience conveyed and the subliminal emotions released. This meant for painters, new approaches to light, tint, outline. It meant for prose writers, a new precision in expressing the vestiges left by experience on memory. It meant for poets, a new perception of the images and symbols of dreams. The forest, the castle, the moonlight, the girl with flaxen hair, the sea, the ship, the lighthouse, the peril, the fear of falling, the tenuousness of life, the elusiveness of whatever it might be that lies beyond the senses. These were the dreamlike concerns of the young musician who, at the turn of the century, had not yet written his engulfed cathedral or his tonal symphony, La Mer, but who had already written the most romantic of his piano pieces, Claire de Lune, and the first of his orchestral masterpieces, The Afternoon of a Fawn. Debussy's inspirations may make him sound like an idle dreamer, an aesthete, a mere sensualist. Actually, he was, like the other French artists of his day, feverishly active, relentlessly precise, wholly dedicated to capturing through his art what they captured through theirs, those aspects of experience that we cannot otherwise articulate. There had to be musical ways of doing this. At 16, Debussy shocked his conservatory teachers by challenging the established rules of harmony, theory, and counterpoint. Many young students have, of course, done the same, but Debussy went on to devise a new palette of sounds by blending Western medieval modes with Eastern pentatonic and whole tone scales, by juxtaposing chords that were, by academic standards, unrelated, 
by experimenting with what was thought at the time to be dissonance. He broke up the symmetrical patterns in which music, and song in particular, had been structured for at least two centuries. He was, in his quiet but determined way, a revolutionary, the first modern composer of the 19th century. And as the century turned, he wanted to write an opera. He would make some poet's words turn into his new sounds. He had already set a few of the symbolist poems of Verlaine and Baudelaire to music. For his opera, he hoped for a drama, quote, in which music begins at the point where speech is powerless. Music, he said, is made for the inexpressible. I want music to have an air of emerging from a shadow into which at times it should return. In the opera house, he went on to say, they sing too much. He was thinking mainly of the works of that thundering Klingsor who dominated the operatic scene at the turn of the century, Richard Wagner. Wagner, too, had broken down musical barriers and left the symbolist poets and impressionist painters in awe. But now Wagner was the new orthodoxy. He was done with his life, but his legacy, Wagnerism, was everywhere. And to a great degree, the flowering of French art a hundred years ago was both a reaction against and a homage paid to the aesthetics of the powerful composer of Tristan and Parsifal. Debussy had gone to Bayreuth to see those works. He loved the endlessly shifting harmonies of Tristan and the medieval aura, the stained glass sound of Parsifal. But he did not love what he regarded as Wagnerian literalness and overemphasis and especially not the prolonged and violent expressions of emotion in Wagner's texts. He wanted a text that achieved its ends through understatement and suggestion. How else was his music to convey on the stage the almost intangible impressions his friends were achieving in the other arts? He longed to find a dramatist who, quote, saying things by halves, would allow me to graft my dream onto his, someone who would conceive characters not bound by time or place, someone who would leave me free to have more art than he and to complete his work. In 1892, soon after Debussy expressed that hope, he found his playwright, a visionary Belgian, Maurice Maeterlinck, 30 years old like himself, Maeterlinck's new play, Peleas et Melisande, seemed to be exactly what Debussy wanted. It was a fluid succession of short scenes, rather than, as with Wagner, three long acts requiring long spans of music, and there was nothing literal or unduly emphatic about this new play. It was a symbolist drama, all nuance and suggestion set in a kingdom that was nowhere and everywhere, in an unspecified century, sometime in the Middle Ages, perhaps, but in effect outside of time, with characters who seemed suspended between willing and acting. And amazingly, the play was replete with the very images, the forest, the castle, the sea, the ship, the moonlight, the girl with the flaxen hair, that haunted the composer. But there was, and this is not said often enough, a vast difference between the young composer and the young playwright. The fastidious Debussy, with his exquisite sense of irony, would have thought it unspeakably vulgar to explain what his dream images might mean. That would be, as Mallarmé had said, to suppress three quarters of their aesthetic value. They were not carriers of meaning, those images. They were carriers of feeling. But Maeterlinck, educated by Jesuits in the Christian mystics and the Greek classics, did not hesitate to say, plainly, at the heart of my dramas lies the idea of a Christian God 
together with the ancient concept of fate. The old king in his Peleas et Melisande speaks of God and fate as if they were interchangeable. At the time Maeterlinck wrote the play, he was deeply imbued with the conviction that human lives were determined by tremendous occult forces which we cannot control. Call them fate or God or some undefined commingling of the two. We cannot understand them. We can only surrender to them. Hence the mysterious atmosphere in the play and the ambivalent, passive, almost unintelligible statements made, especially by the heroine. Maeterlinck later moved from his fatalism to occultism, pantheism, and eventually to a final fashionable agnosticism. And his literary reputation after his Nobel Prize in 1911 steadily declined. His fame now rests largely on the play Debussy set to music, music which preserved almost all of the play and, to a great extent, redefined it. For Debussy said nothing about, and possibly cared little for, Maeterlinck's fatalism. He valued the play because its elusive, mysterious qualities presented him with an incomparable opportunity to apply his musical theories to drama. It was not an easy task. It took him almost ten years to write Peleas, and for several years after the premiere in 1902, he was still making changes in it. He wanted every bar to bear the imprint of his new impressionistic style, to resonate with his own unique sound. Our recording features the Berlin Philharmonic under the direction of that master of sound textures, Herbert von Karajan. No conductor of our century has been more skilled in realizing the dynamic range of music from the whispered pianissimo to the thundering fortissimo. There are only four fortissimo markings in all of Peleas, and it begins, as we shall now hear, with just about the quietest pianissimo on record. We are in a dark forest, and Debussy sets his scene with a somber theme built on a rising fifth. Could he have known that in the Middle Ages the rising fifth was the musical synonym for God, that it could serve as a synonym for Maeterlinck's fate. Debussy might object to our calling that theme fate. He had harsh words for Wagner's system of musical motifs associated with ideas and characters. All the same, he was not unwilling to adapt the contributions of others, including Wagner, when they suited his special purposes. And throughout Peleas, he limbs his characters with recurrent themes, though he does not employ the themes with Wagner's complexity and obsessiveness. Four bars into the opera, we hear the theme associated with Golo, a hunter lost in the forest, abandoned by his hounds, in pursuit of a bleeding, wounded beast which has escaped him. The reminiscence of the opening of Dante's Inferno is surely intended. Wagner would have given this hunter a brusque, violent motif, but Debussy's hunter is the only person in the drama who attempts to define his own destiny to resist the fate that envelops him. Debussy gives him a restless, tentative, musical fragment that tries to free itself but cannot from its grounding in the fate theme. With a slight change of instrumentation, and in tonality, the two themes are repeated, a gentle, somber fate and a man unable to escape from it.
Suddenly there is a gleam of light in the forest. Melisande. That is the theme, and light is the symbol that will define Melisande throughout the opera. Golo is taken with her instantly. She is beautiful like a child. She has been hurt. She will not say by whom. She is weeping by a forest pool. Her crown lies submerged in its waters. She will not let Golo touch her or retrieve her crown. She will throw herself into the water if he tries. She pities him, though, for his hair is already growing gray. She says he looks like a giant. He cannot stop looking into her eyes, which seem never to close. The two introduce themselves. He is the grandson of Arkel, king of Alamond, that is, perhaps to say, of all the world. She is simply Melisande. She will not answer his other questions. She will go with him if he promises not to touch her. He says he does not know where he is going. He is lost, too. And the scene ends. Here are José Van Damme and Frederica von Stade as Golo and Melisande, singing in the subtle combination of speech and song to which Debussy set Maeterlinck's text. He clearly owes a debt here to Mussorgsky, the composer of Boris Godunov. But actually, this kind of speech song is as old in opera as the first operas themselves, those of the Florentine Camerata. And in any case, Debussy has, with great care, made the musical line match the inflections of the French language. The scene changes from the forest to the castle. The music, with an initial reminiscence of Mussorgsky's Boris, gradually and perhaps deliberately suggests the scene change from the forest to the castle in Wagner's Parsifal. In the castle, Golo's mother, Genevieve, is reading a letter he has sent to his brother Peleas. Actually, Golo and Peleas are half-brothers. They have a common mother in Genevieve and very little else in common. Golo's father is dead. Peleas' father, 
we eventually discover, is dying in a room upstairs. Listening to the letter is their grandfather, King Arkel. Genevieve reads as if from a storybook Golo's account of the events we have just seen. I found her one evening in tears beside a pool in the forest where I had lost my way. It is now six months since I married her, and I know no more about her than on the day we met. But you, my dear Peleas, whom I love more than a brother, prepare for my return. Our mother will understand but I am not sure of King Arkel. If he agrees to welcome Melisande as his own daughter, then on the third day light a lamp at the top of the tower which faces the sea. I shall see it from the bridge of my ship. If there is no light, I shall sail on and never come back. Here is Nadine Denise reading the letter. At one point, Debussy has her continue for 28 syllables at the same pitch. But note the ominous drop when she reads La Mer, the sea. Genevieve seems to know that sorrow awaits them all. King Arkel responds, and we hear why Golo will wait to see the signaling lamp before he sails into Alamond. Golo's first wife has died, and the old king had hoped that now he would marry the princess Ursule. That would have ended the wars between his kingdom and the next. But as Arkel speaks, we soon hear that he does not object to the new marriage. It has, like everything else, been decreed by fate. King Arkel's theme, quiet, almost religious in its resignation, is related to the fate theme. Here, with his theme, is Ruggiero Raimondi as King Arkel. <laughs> Perhaps Arkel sings over a sonorous orchestra. Perhaps nothing occurs without a purpose. Suddenly the old man, almost blind, senses that someone has come into the room. It is Peleas, Richard Stilwell in this recording. He is still a youth, and he has been weeping. He cannot make a difficult choice. Accordingly, his theme wavers quietly between chords that are musically irreconcilable as his mother sings, What Shall We Do? Oh, 
Elias has received another letter. His friend Marcellus is dying and has a presentiment of the very day death will come. Pelias must leave immediately to be with him. Arkel, who can see Pelias when he steps into the light, tells him that he must not leave, for even while his friend is dying, his father too is dying in the room above, and soon his brother's return will alter all their lives. Pelias, as always, does not choose. His mother tells him to light the lamp at the top of the tower to signal Golo home. And we hear the change of scene music that depicts Golo and Melisande coming slowly across the sea. We recognize their themes, hers very bright on a solo violin, his dark and quietly restless, then turning very tender. Now we find ourselves in front of the castle. Melisande has her first glimpse of the grounds. It's so dark here, she exclaims, so many forests. Genevieve quietly agrees. I was amazed too when I first came here. There are places where you never see the sun, but you get used to it. Look the other way. You'll see the light from the sea. Yet when Melisande looks, the sea is misted over. Pelias climbs up from the side of the sea and joins them. Tonight, he says, without realizing the full import of his words, you could sail out without knowing and never come back. The three of them watch as, by the beacon from a single lighthouse shining through the mist, the ship that brought Melisande to Alamond sails away. We hear the almost ghostly chanting of the crew in the distance. A storm is coming on. Melisande fears that the ship will be lost at sea. Finally, as Pelias observes, the night falls quickly. Pelias offers to take Melisande's hand and lead her back to the castle, but her arms are full of flowers. He says, Perhaps tomorrow I shall go away. She says, Oh, why must you go? Her theme hovers in the air. The final chord is unresolved. The question is left hanging. Should he go? Must he go? 
in Allemande, there are no answers to such questions. Act two begins at a well near the castle. For once the sun is shining, but Peleus and Melisande have come to the well for the shade of the trees. A well, if Debussy will permit me just this once to suggest an archetypal explanation, a well suggests the depths of the unconscious. Melisande exclaims at how clear the water is. Pelias tells her that it once had healing properties and could restore sight to the blind. But now there are no more miracles at the well of the blind. The king himself cannot be cured. You can hear the water sleep. Is that to say that the characters in Alamond have lost touch with their unconscious depths? That they have all, to varying degrees, surrendered or must surrender to the dark, quiet fate that envelops and controls them? Melisande tries to see to the bottom of the well. Pelias says it is as deep as the sea. She is sure that if something bright were shining below, one could see to the bottom. He cautions her against leaning too far. She might fall. Her hands cannot reach the water's surface, but her long hair does as she leans forward. In a moment, as he remembers that his brother found her beside a forest pool, she is tossing her wedding ring up to catch the sunlight, and it drops to the water's depths. Tossing the ring in the air over the well, when it might easily fall to the depths, seems, like all of Melisande's actions, both deliberate and accidental. It might mean that she wants subliminally to abandon her husband for his brother, or it might mean that she wants to illuminate for all of them the depths of the unconscious they have lost touch with, or again, it might mean nothing at all. As Mallarmé had said, to explain it would be to suppress three-quarters of its aesthetic value. What will we tell Golo, she asks. La vérité, he responds, the truth. In fact, they will tell Golo neither truth nor untruth. Pelias observes that it was noon, just striking twelve, as the ring fell. The scene change music suggests another ring, Wagner's ring.
With that abrupt variant of Golo's theme, we find him lying on his bed with blood on his pillow, injured when his horse, on the stroke of twelve, seemed to see something, bolted, blindly struck a tree, and threw him. Golo remembers, It was as if the whole forest lay on my breast. I thought my heart had been torn apart. The ring and the horse are the symbols Wagner's hero and heroine exchange before they are torn from each other. There is no question with this ominous coincidence of two events at the stroke of noon that Golot has already lost Melisande, though he insists now, my heart is whole, it was nothing. Melisande tends to him, but says that she is not happy in the castle and wants to leave. Who has offended you, he asks. Is it the king? Is it my mother? Is it Peleos? No, no, she responds. It is not Peleos. She is sad, she says, because she wants to see the sky. He appeals to reason, gently assuring her that the summer is coming, and she'll see the sky then. He takes her hands, soft as flowers, to comfort her, and then exclaims in sudden anger that the ring he gave her is gone. She says, untruthfully, but perhaps on impulse, that she lost the ring in a cave by the sea. He orders her to retrieve it before the tide comes in. He cannot leave his sick bed. Pelias will go with her. She repeats, I am not happy here. The scene changes to the cave by the sea. It is a place of great beauty and danger. Though they both know that the ring is not there, Peleas and Melisande venture inside. It is dark. I ought to have brought a torch, he says. Let us wait till the moon has broken through that cloud bank. There's a path here that proceeds between two pools, of which the bottom has never been found. When a light is lit, you would think the roof was studded with stars. The sea is not happy tonight. In a moment, the moonlight does flood the cave, but all Peleas and Merisande find within is a huddled group of three starving beggars asleep. She starts in fright. He explains there is a famine in the land. She refuses his hand as they leave. It is an ending to parallel the end of the first act. He says, though the ring is not there, we'll come back another day. Act two ends with the waves quietly lapping at the cave's entrance.
Richard Strauss, the composer of such splendidly noisy operas as Salome and Electra, said when he saw this opera, Yes, but I can't hear anything. Henrik Ibsen, the author of such realistic social dramas as Pillars of Society and An Enemy of the People, said when he read the text that inspired this opera, What does it mean? I simply don't understand this sort of thing. In the mid-twentieth century, it used to be said that Pelias was an eccentric work without a real place in the history of music, that it was freakish, that it had no successors. Now, at the end of the century, we can see that Debussy's music, profoundly original even in the way it uses some of the techniques of other composers, has itself influenced much of opera right across the twentieth century, from Puccini's Fanciulla del West to Poulenc's Dialogues of the Carmelites, to Messiaen's St. Francis. And it has long been clear that Maeterlinck's text, rife with symbols, unanswered questions, and elusive non sequiturs, influenced the Salome of Oscar Wilde that served as the text for Richard Strauss. It has also inspired orchestral music by such diverse composers as Schoenberg, Sibelius, and Fauré. Other plays of Maeterlinck were soon set to music by Paul Ducat and lesser composers in the hope of creating another Pelias. Now critics speak of the numerous progeny of Pelias and Melisande, existentialist drama, the theater of the absurd, and much of the music of the avant-garde. But there is no question that the text has dated. The play can no longer be performed without the music. Even in its day, it was fatally easy for the irreverent to caricature or for critics to expose as a conventional bourgeois situation deliberately, not to say perversely, couched in obscure language and laid over with symbols to give the suggestion of substance. I cannot subscribe to those critical opinions. Maeterlinck's symbols suggest to me meanings that, in my ordinary life, I might otherwise be totally unaware of. But then, I've long since surrendered to the music that gives those symbols and the whole text nuance and color. Debussy thought enough of the text to set it verbatim, only cutting for practical purposes four scenes and a few lines here and there. Maeterlinck, who knew nothing about music, had no objection till much later when the opera was in production, and he found that his mistress, Georgette Leblanc, was not going to play Mélisande. The director of the Opera Comique, Albert Carré, and André Messager, who was to conduct, wanted and got the marvelous Mary Garden for the part. They may both have been romantically involved with her, but she was in any case the artist for the role. Maeterlinck, furious, made a scene at Debussy's house, threatening him with physical violence. Then he consulted a clairvoyant to find out whether he should challenge Carré to a duel. He was dissuaded. He also lodged a formal complaint with the Société des Auteurs, wrote an open letter to Le Figaro disowning the opera and expressing his hope that it would be an immediate and utter failure, and he had distributed at the first public dress rehearsal a satirical attack on the production. All of this led, paradoxically, to an audience reaction against not the performers, not the music, but the text. When, eighteen years later, Maeterlinck actually heard the opera, he admitted he had been wrong. Debussy was dead by then, but Maeterlinck wrote to Mary Garden to say that her performance had enabled him at last to understand his own mysterious text.
What are we to make of the characters in Alamond? Characters which even the playwright who created them didn't pretend to understand. The enigmatic Melisande has been thought everything from a damoiselle élue, a pre-Raphaelite beauty, a storybook princess, to a femme fatale, a schemer, a deliberate destroyer of human happiness. Maeterlinck wrote a later play, Ariane et Barbe Bleu, in which Melisande is identified as one of Bluebeard's eight wives, escaped at last from his terrible castle. That might be why Maggie Tate, a famous Melisande, insisted it was why Melisande is first seen weeping, hurt, a fugitive in the forest, unconcerned about the loss of the crown he, that is to say Bluebeard, gave her. But that does not explain Melisande's deviousness when she comes to Alamonde. C.J. Luton has observed that in the course of the opera, Melisande tells 17 unarguable lies, not counting her many half-truths and evasions. But the real point to be made about Melisande is that she is not interested in logic and reason. There is no point in them. She knows intuitively that Maeterlinck's world, Alamonde, is ruled not by logic and reason, but by fate, that the course of her life there is fixed, no matter what she does. Alamond is Maeterlinck's fatalist vision of all the world. Pereas feels he should leave it and never come back. Golot is not sure he should return to it. Genevieve remembers her own adverse reaction when she first came to it. Arkel has finally surrendered to spending the rest of his days in it. Melisande is wiser than any of them. Why are her answers so illogical, her actions so unmotivated? She knows that the world, which is all the world according to Maeterlinck, is dominated by a dark, if quietly pitying, fate. The others only realize this in proportion to their ages. Old King Arkell knows it best. His surrender to fate is all but complete. He cannot understand the human condition in which he finds himself, but he feels it deeply. Oh, the sadness of it, he exclaims, the sadness of everything one sees. This from a man who is almost blind. Arkel's daughter, Genevieve, is a grandmother, but still young enough to think that fate can be, if not avoided, at least ignored. Look the other way, she says of the darkness you'll see the light from the sea. But the sea is shrouded, and a storm threatens the lone ship that ventures forth on it. Golo, the heir to the castle, the hunter, the husband, knows less of fate and actually tries to resist it. I am a man of blood and steel, he says. He is pragmatic and resourceful. He concerns himself with social conditions, with his kingdom's wars. He begets two children. He always makes the human effort to see the world around him with reason. Be reasonable, Melisande, he pleads at one touching moment. Be reasonable. You're crying because you can't see the sky? You're too old to cry about such a thing. But the world in which Golo lives is one where reason plays no role, where all is sense, and even sense is dimmed by mist and darkness. Fate rules. Melisande unhappily accepts that. Golot does not. That is why he alone of the characters does reprehensible things, and why he suffers the most. If we cannot feel with Golot, the opera will be unintelligible to us, and we will not be moved by it. For in the world of Alamond, Golot, more than any of the others, is ourselves. Peleas, the grandson of King Arkel, is a youth awakening to sexuality, alive to sensual experience, and hardly aware of fate. He is told often to try to escape from it, but, unaware as he is, he does not know what to do. Soon to appear is Inyold, the great-grandson of King Arkel, a little boy far removed from from any awareness of the power which foredestines all their lives. When, in Act Four, 
he is given his first glimpse of it, he thinks with childlike confidence that by telling his elders about it, he can forestall it. Finally, in the last scene, we will see the last little member of this family, a newborn baby girl. She knows nothing yet of the power that sadly envelops them all, but the presentiment of sadness is already on her face. The future, we are told, will be no different than the past has been. Call this view of the world beautiful, poetic, and true, or call it, as it can appear to be when divested of its poetic images, illogical, inane, and intolerable, it was in either case a view of the world that the world at large would long since have dismissed had Alamond not been waiting to be etched in Debussy's impressionistic colors. When Act Three begins, it is evening, and Melisande, preparing for bed, is combing her long hair as it falls Rapunzel-like from the castle tower. My hair, she sings, is waiting for you all the day long, all the day long. That could be an invitation to a lover, even a confession of guilt. But this is the ambivalent song. The song innocently concludes in a little litany of prophets and angels and a reference to the time of day when everything is poised on the brink of change. St. Daniel and St. Michael, St. Michael and St. Raphael, I was born of a Sunday, a Sunday at noon. Suddenly, Peleos appears in the shadows below. He has never seen so many stars or the moon lingering so late over the sea, and her radiant hair at the window, it is as if someone had lit a light there, too. He plans to leave tomorrow. He has come to say goodbye. She thinks she sees a rose, sexual surrender, perhaps, in the shadows below. He, in the shadows below, says that what she sees is not a rose at all. It seems, though we can never be quite sure, that their love has not been, nor will it ever be, consummated. As at the well, so here at the tower, her hands cannot reach down, but her hair does, tumbling around him. He exclaims that her tresses are alive, like birds in his hands. Suddenly, Golo is there. Melisande, do not lean so far out of the window, he says. You will fall. And then he adds, to reassure himself, your children, both of you, just children. But he is not reassured. In the next brief scene, all the more terrifying for being understated, Golo takes his younger half-brother by the arm down to the castle vaults to see the stagnant pools far below, to smell, quote, the stench of death that, when you lean forward, comes up and strikes you in the face. Hey, 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 hey,
We fear now that it is Pelias who might lean over too far, even that Golo will push him over. But Golo only waves his lantern to throw light on the walls and the depths, and Pelias, terrified and stifling, pleads, Let's go out. They mount from the vaults, and then it is the fresh air from the noonday sea that strikes Pelias in the face. In the open air, under the sky, everything appears to be innocent. Peleos exclaims, perhaps protesting too much, that he can hear church bells ringing, smell fresh-watered roses, and see little children going down to the sea to swim. And as for the guilty tower window, why, Melisande is there with their mother. Golo is not deceived. I saw you last night. It was only a childish game, but it mustn't happen again. Melisande is very delicate, and she is going to be a mother. It's not the first time I have suspected that there might be something between you. You are older than she. A word to you is enough. Keep away from her, but quietly. The next scene is devastating, though there's hardly a scene in opera that is so difficult to do well. Golo brings his little son Ignold, Christian Barbo, to the foot of the tower and questions him about Pelias and Melisande. Golo, even in his desperation, makes his son spy on them. The scene is poignant because the father clearly loves the boy he so misuses and because the boy's answers, while completely straightforward, are maddeningly ambivalent. Wilfred Mellers points out that Golo's questions are accompanied by the whole tone music we heard in the vaults, the horror beneath the surface of the mind, while the boy's answers are in the simplest pentatonic tones, like nursery rhymes. <laughs> Avec une lanterne dans le jardin. Ils ont mal dit qu'ils ne s'aimaient pas. Ils parlaient qu'ils se querellent souvent. Non, mais c'est vrai. She's often with your uncle Pelias, isn't she? Yes, Daddy, whenever you're not here. Ah, what do they talk about? About the door. What about the door? They say it can't be open. You're hurting me. I didn't mean to hurt you. Don't cry. What else do they say? They say that soon I'm going to grow up. Oh, the tortured man shouts, and Maeterlinck's images, in their usual way, begin to double upon themselves. I'm like a blind man looking for a treasure at the bottom of the sea, like a little child lost in the forest, and you... He suspects that his little son has seen, in his innocence, what he himself will never be able to discover. The boy wonders why his father is so frightened. The father says he has just seen a wolf go by in the forest. 
Then, do they ever tell you to go away and play? No, Daddy. If I go away, they are afraid. How do you know that? Because they are always crying in the dark. Oh, God, give me patience, Kolo shouts. And then, do they kiss? Kiss? No. Oh, yes, once they kissed, the day it rained. How did they kiss? Like this. Oh, Daddy, how your beard tickles. A light goes on in the window, and in our next excerpt, Golo holds his little son up to the window. Can you see her? Is she in the room? Oh, yes, it is very bright. Is she alone? Yes. Oh, no, Uncle Pelias is with her. You're hurting me. Keep watching, keep watching, Inyold. I didn't mean to hurt you, I just stumbled. Golo's breathless questioning becomes obsessive and violent. What are they doing? They're looking at the light. Are they moving closer? No, they never shut their eyes. Oh, Daddy, let me down. Golo lets the boy down. He has learned nothing. In Act Four, we are inside the castle. Pelias, who has never left on the voyage to be with his dying friend, descends from the room where his dying father has, against all odds, recovered. In fact, his father has taken his hand and said, Is that you, Peleas? Why, I never noticed it before. You have the serious, kindly look of one who has not long to live. You must go on a voyage. You must go away. Ought Peleas to have gone away to comfort his friend and so saved himself? Or was he right to have stayed to see his father through his illness? Is that why the father recovered? In the world of Alamond, we never know whether the choices we make are for good or ill. Perhaps we do not choose at all, but only think we do. That is why images of blindness and seeing recur so often in the text. Pelias, now intent on leaving, and leaving forever, asks Melisande to meet him one last time at the well of the blind. Then he leaves distractedly. Old King Arkel, now that the atmosphere of death is gone from the castle, is sure that Melisande will create happiness for all of them. takes her in his arms and kisses her. But happiness is impossible in the world of Alamond. Golo enters with blood on his brow. I've come through a hedge of thorns, he explains. They've just found another peasant starved to death down by the sea. He asks for his sword and stares into Melisande's eyes. Why are you looking at me like that, he says. I'm not going to kill you. Then he says to the half-blind king, Look at those eyes of hers. I see nothing there, the old man says, but a great innocence. A great innocence, Golo exclaims ruefully. Yes, they could give God lessons in innocence, those eyes. You would think that the angels were forever baptizing there. He turns to Melisande. I know those eyes. I've seen them at their work. Shut them. 
Shut them or I'll shut them forever. Give me your hands. No, I don't want to touch you. Give me your hair. And with the cry, Absalom, Absalom, the Old Testament son of David caught in death by his long hair, Golo takes Melisande by her long hair, forces her to her knees, and hysterically thrusts her head upwards, downwards, left and right. Pierre Boulez has suggested that this is a savage parody of the sign of the cross. King Arkell shouts out in shock, Golo, and stops him. Then the old man whispers, If I were God, I would have pity on the hearts of men. And the orchestra develops at length, not King Arkell's theme, not Melisande's, but Golo's. That savage man is the one God should pity. In the next scene, Golo's little son, Ignold, is shown at the well of the blind, trying to retrieve a ball that has rolled beneath a boulder. The familiar images recur. The boy wants to retrieve his golden ball, as his father wanted to retrieve a precious ring. His arm isn't long enough to reach it, as his stepmother's wasn't long enough to reach the well water surface, or to reach his uncle's hand from the tower. It grows dark. For the little prince is now to be given his first glimpse of the fate that drives all creatures on their way. A flock of sheep passes by, ruthlessly driven by a shepherd whom we never see. Inyold asks why the sheep are crying. The shepherd's voice answers from a distance, because they are not going to the sheepfold.
he kneeled, sensing that all this is tremendously important, and of course on a symbolic level it is, for the sheep are going to their deaths, runs off saying, I'm going to tell someone about this. For children, even matters as inscrutable as the workings of fate are something they are sure their elders can explain. Pelias comes to blind man's well for his last meeting with Melisande. He realizes now, as the images in the text continue to double on one another, that he has acted like a child, playing with something he did not understand. Now, he says, he will flee like a blind man who escapes the destruction of his house. But first, there are some things about Melisande he has already forgotten. This time he must really look into her eyes, or his memories will vanish. She appears, and they sing, at last, a love duet, sometimes impassioned, sometimes halted by moments of stillness. At the climactic moment, I love you, I love you too. The words are not, as in Wagner's sung fortissimo on the surge of an orchestral swell, but halted, almost whispered, without a single sound from the orchestra. The lovers hear the castle doors being closed and bolted. Almost surely, we think, it is Golo locking them outside and coming to find them. It is too late now to turn back. Soon Golo is there in the shadows. For the first time in the opera, two voices blend, the lovers kiss. Perhaps it is their first kiss of passion. Pelias exclaims that all the stars are falling, and Golo strikes his brother down. I can remember performances of Peleas in cities in both Europe and America where the audience thinned out over the course of the evening so that by this last intermission the house was one-third empty. The reason to some degree was that there was simply too much declaimed text for audiences that didn't know French. But even those who knew French said, as they made for the exits, it's beautiful, but it leaves me unmoved. What has all of this to do with me? Where is the catharsis of great drama? The catharsis comes now. All of this has everything to do with you. The last act, a single scene, takes place in Melisande's bedroom, where she lies dying. When Golo killed Peleas, he wounded her, too. But the doctor says it is not from that tiny wound that she is going to die. It would not have killed a bird. We hear a new variant of Melisande's theme. It is now regular in rhythm, stately as a pavane for a dead princess. In this passage we hear Pascal Thomas as the doctor.
Golo is in the room with the doctor and the old king. His grief is terrible. I've killed her for no reason. Isn't it enough to make the stones weep? They kissed like little children, like brother and sister. I didn't want to do it. Melisande wakes. Open the window, she says. King Arkel, almost blind, nonetheless moves to the window, opens it, and says, The sun is setting on the sea. As the sun goes down, Melisande whispers that there is something she knows, but when Arkel bends to ask what it is, it has, like the sun, passed away. The orchestra intones under her words the variant of her theme that now marks her death. Are you alone with me, grandfather? she asks. No, the doctor is here. And there's someone else here. You must not be afraid. He will not hurt you. If you are afraid, he will go away. He is very unhappy. Who is that? It's... it's your husband. It's Golo. Is Golo here? Why doesn't he come to me? Golo sends the others away, promising to leave the door open. He must speak to his wife alone, otherwise he can never die in peace. The others leave. Melisande, are you sorry for me as I am for you? Do you forgive me, Melisande? Yes, yes. What is there to forgive? I have hurt you, Melisande, and now I am going to die. And I must know the truth. You must tell the truth to someone who is going to die. Will you tell me the truth? Yes. Did you love Peleas? Why, yes, I loved him. Where is he? You don't understand. Was your love guilty? Tell me yes. No, no, we weren't guilty. Why do you ask? For the love of God, tell me the truth. I'll forgive you everything. But in Maeterlinck's world, in which all is foredestined, and also in Debussy's Impressionist world, in which all knowledge comes through the senses, we never know the truth about ourselves. We shall never know it here. Goulot, in despair at ever finding out, says to the doctor and the old king, You can come in. I shall never know. I shall die here in blindness. But must go low, must we despair? The old king asks Melisande if she would like to see her child. What child? Why, your little girl, here. Melisande cannot reach the baby. All her days what she wanted was just out of reach. She says of the child, She doesn't smile. She's very small. She will cry as I did. I pity her.
On those soft steps, intoning the theme of Melisande's death, the serving women fill the room, knowing intuitively that the moment of death has come. Goulot, in a panic, says, Oh, I must tell her something. Leave me alone with her. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. The old king says, We mustn't trouble her any more. The human soul likes to pass away alone. Mais la tristesse, Goulot, the sadness of everything one sees. So says the king, who can hardly see at all. Suddenly the serving women have dropped to their knees. Melisande has died without a word. The doctor says, the women know. A bell tolls. Golo weeps. His theme recurs, penitent and humbled. And the old king says, in the last and tenderest of the opera's monologues, don't stay here, Golo. She needs silence now. It is terrible, but it is not your fault. She was a poor little creature, mysterious, like everyone in the world. She lies there as if she were the older sister of her child. Come, the child mustn't stay in this room. It must live now in her place. It is the turn of the poor little one. C'est au tour de la pauvre petite. Mm. Pas ici, Golo, il lui faut le silence maintenant. Venez, venez. C'est terrible, que ce n'est pas votre faute. C'est cette petite être. Oh, 
The light from the sea through the castle window, the slowly descending melody, the gently tolling bell, the muted trumpet depicting Melisande's soul in flight, it is a final statement not just of pity with Maeterlinck for the death of one who accepted her fate without question, but of wonder with Debussy at the sheer beauty of the world in which she lived her predestined life, the beauty of the world of images that impinge on our senses. Not everyone, certainly not a professional Christian like myself, can respond to Maeterlinck's notion of fate inexorably directing human lives and making all human action pitiable and futile. But everyone who has five senses can respond to Debussy's evocation of what it is to be alive to the wonder and the pathos of the world in which we all live. The king submits, as always, to Maeterlinck's pessimism. Death is the ending to a life of incomprehensible sadness, determined by a fate we cannot control. The newborn baby will have to weep the same tears her mother wept. But in Debussy's ineffable music, half requiem, half lullaby, there is not just heart-stopping sensuous beauty. There is a suggestion of transcendence of both pain and purposelessness. There may be a realm beyond Alamond, of which the senses here give us only impressions. There may be. That is the way with impressionist paintings, with symbolist poems, and with this opera. Beauty, if we can sense it, is all around us. But what truth is, what the meaning of life is, of that the wonderful music of Claude Debussy will only give impressions.